You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers, welcome to the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Kelly, and today in one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice Podcast, I chat to Kiki Hausler. She's based in Stuttgart in Germany. She has a veterinary rehabilitation practice there and is involved also in research in, with the University of Cambridge. We chat to her about all the research, how she is collecting data in her clinic, as well as the challenges that she's faced over the 13 years of having her practice. So over to Kiki. Welcome, Kiki. Hey, Megan. Thanks for having me today. I'm really happy to talk about what we do here. <laughs> Kiki, um, you have obviously got your journey in veterinary rehabilitation, and I always ask um, everyone, how did they get into to the field? Um, so explain to us a little bit about your journey. Uh, Well, it was probably a bit personal. So um, I had a dog that needed some rehab and then I went to spend some time an internship at a clinic in the US. And so that was kind of like how I got into doing some some sort of rehab. And then I started off with a CCRP. And now you're actually involved in research and you're getting more and more into um, veterinary rehabilitation. And I'd like to touch on a little bit of your research later. But before we do that, um, can we chat about your clinic? So you're based in Stuttgart in Germany. How many therapists do you have? So I have two therapists working for me. One is certified in a German um, education program or was certified. And the other one is an American a lady and she's a CCRP as well. And so how many patients are coming through your door per day on average? So we have about 15 to 25 patients a day. Sure. Okay. Lot. And yeah, that's a lot. And, and you're doing underwater treadmill and hydrotherapy too? We have an underwater treadmill. That's what I started off with. Yes. So we're doing a lot of movement work, balance, coordination. And any other support staff to support the two of you? Yes, we do have another person who does uh, who does a lot of the appointment and you know the stuff with documentation, which we have to uh, you know keep up with closely with having a lot of or seeing a lot of clients. There's a lot of stuff to do. Yes, all the stuff that our, us vet rehabbers hate to do. So it's always yes. good to have a person to do it. And but yeah, and person, you know. <laughs> And you um, consult how many days a week? We consult from Tuesday to Saturday. We, um, I decided on closing on Monday to have people come in, if, you know, if they work, to see us on Saturdays. So that's a full working day. Okay. And your hours? Um, it's a bit different. Like on, on Tuesday, we have like a really long day. We will start at 9 in the morning. And it, most of the times we stop at 8 or 9 in the evening. We don't really have breaks in between, so we kind of rotate. Uh, Wednesdays is a bit shorter. It would be 9 to 5, and then on Thursdays, we would start noon and go um, maybe until 9 o'clock in the evening, so we have late hours for people who work. Friday is kind of a normal day. It would be a 9 to 5 again, and Saturday is an 8 to probably 5, yes. Okay, so some really long days there. Yes. So um, how do you guys work holidays? So the two of you is, I mean, do you close over any period of time where you don't see patients or is only one person allowed to take leave? Um, Well, this year we decided to close um, during, you know, um, Christmas and and New Year because um, we had a ton of work while doing, you know, we have a lot of clients, but... um, we had to stop for that time and take a break, yes. So you close for like seven days or 10 days? Well, it's uh, in between the holidays, it's two, three days, I think we're closed and we're gonna open up on the second weekend. Okay. So. Yeah, I also used to do that sometimes. And also a lot of the time people, um, they often miss their appointments in that time. And I also found that I wasn't that busy when I was open during that time. Yeah. So I used to make it a yearly thing, I just used to, close around Christmas and New Year. 
I think you sometimes you have to take a break because you don't really serve your clients well if you're um, a bit overworked. So we decided we're just uh, all of us going to take off. Yeah, it sometimes makes it a little bit tricky the week leading up to the break and then the week afterwards oh, yes. because then you're crazy, you're just squashing them all in. So yes. you're fully booked. Um, but it's worth it just to have a few days, a few yes. days off to recoup. So um, the question I have, because, you know, I obviously follow you on Facebook, so I see how busy you are and I see that you're involved in research and you're often going up to Cambridge. So how, with all those hours and all those patients, do you fit in um, getting research done? Uh, it's a bit tricky and I try to do that on my days off. So I would take off like on Saturday and uh, be back on Tuesday. So that's uh, kind of like where I have to squish it into um, the schedule and I wouldn't be able to do it without my staff. So they are really supportive of what I'm doing. They're really interested and you know, I couldn't do that without them and couldn't do it without my family. So I have a six year old daughter as well and a husband. So, and the dogs, three dogs. So we kind of like squish it all together, but they're really supportive and it works. Yes. But it's then, obviously the days off. And the research that you're doing there, is it ongoing? So you're having to go every, every month or how does it work? Um, well, we do uh, collect data there, but now since I have equipment at the clinic, I'm able to collect data here as well. So we're trying to get it to a multi-center approach uh, where you can collect data at different places. But sometimes I definitely have to go there and collect data with the, or with the team, yes. Okay, so tell us about the research that you're currently involved in there. Um, it's probably two things I have to uh, talk about. So um, I got involved with Cambridge um, talking about or showing them how to use shockwave on small animals. So I'm using a certain type of shockwave I can use without sedation or anesthesia since I'm, a, I'm not a vet. So I can't use that. Um, so that was very important for me. Um, and I got to show them how to do it. Um, so we're doing research on elbows in uh, OA dogs. Um, and the other thing we're doing is we would try to find a, um, a tool where we could um, gather data more easily um, than using force plates or even like uh, just um, like a carpet or something, because I don't have that much space yet. So we found a device we could use here and there, so we can do a shockwave treatments here and in Cambridge and get the data collected. So that is part of the, um, the research we're doing. And then we started off um, looking at certain cases like non-hailing uh, unions, non-unions, and we had um, one just published. Um, that was uh, a fracture in a chihuahua in the medibula um, region. So that was pretty impressive how that worked. Um, yeah, that's basically what we're doing. And on the treadmill, we're looking at different equipment attached to dogs. So I can't really get too much into detail there. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting. And so that equipment you're obviously using in your clinic now. So when you're collecting data, are you collecting on specific patients or specific clients of yours, or is it every single client that's coming on you collecting data now? Well, what I'm trying to do is uh, like almost get any client uh, to go onto the treadmill to collect data. Um, so I'm trying to do some basic research so we would know how does velocity um, change gait, um, how, when do they start to trot, what is like basically in the sizes, we see all sizes of dogs and breeds of dogs and indications. So we need a lot of basic data on the dogs. And on the other hand, we try to see and get some of the real indications like maybe a dog pre-TPLO, post-TPLO onto the treadmill and see how do they walk? How does the surgery change their gait, the biomechanics? So where does the weight shifting go immediately after and in the follow-up? And so that is something that might even in, be interesting for the surgeons as well. So how and what do we alter with those um, surgeries? Or yeah, there's a lot of 
interesting stuff, and we haven't seen that much data on it. So I basically almost drag any dog onto the treadmill, and uh, it's really nice because they're not dragged. They really like to walk. Before I touch them and manipulate, because a lot of, a lot of them have been manipulated a lot, um, they like to walk. They're like, oh, that's easy. I can do that. So yeah, that's a it's a neat approach that makes it a lot easier to deal with them afterwards. And and are you finding the results that you're getting from the data just within your clinic is helping you with your your own patients? It is definitely helping me, and it's um, a good way to. You know, sometimes you're in a tunnel and you get like a TPL dog, you just do the common thing you would do or we used to do. And you ever so often get one of the clients where you kind of like feel stuck with what you're doing. And that's when I, when I'm able and I'm really happy to do that now and get them on the treadmill and, you know, try to figure out what's going wrong. Where do I have to manipulate? What do I have to alter in the treatment plan? Is there any other exercises? Is there anything I can do? So it helps me a lot with dealing with myself, you know, not being doing like a routine uh, on the dogs. So, yeah. So, and have you ro roped your other therapist into collecting data for you too, or is it just you? Um, well, if I'm, if I'm not in clinic, um, they have to take uh, the data as well. And um, it's easier for me, you know, when they call me and will tell me, well, there's a problem, we see this or that, they will put the dog on the treadmill and I can see them actually walking. I have the video data um, as well going with it. It's not just the pause. Uh, so that's a lot easier for me when I'm not in clinic, yes. Okay, so it helps all around. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, let's um, go back to just chatting about um, the clinic and the running of the clinic. Um, so how many years ha has the clinic been open? Well, we're open for 13 years now, so wow. that's quite a long time, yes. We've moved uh, twice, and I'm not going to move again. <laughs> so, yes. So we're now in a really nice place. It's uh, 140 square meters, so we have four rooms, uh, one large exercise room, um, one for the underwater treadmill, the other one for the land treadmill, and then we have obviously the room where we do the manual treatment, uh, the pulse magnetic field, the shockwave, yes, so. And is that uh, rented or board property? No, it's rented. Rented, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to find exactly what you need. Um, and always when you're renting, it's always the worry whether you do have to move. So I hope that you're there to stay. It sounds, it sounds like a perfect size, really nice and big. So, yes, I hope so too. But it's uh, Stuttgart is a really busy area. It's uh, hugely expensive and it's not easy to find a place where you can treat dogs uh, because, you know, uh, landlords are a bit not so keen of having animals in the house. So, um, yeah, that's really good. So if you look back um, over the last 13 years, is there anything that you would have done differently? Um, probably, probably not. To be honest, I think um, it's an evolving field. Um, I sometimes do think, oh, well, I should have done this or that. But I don't think it really changes anything if you go back and look back. Um, what I'm really focused on is that I have to um, do what I'm doing right now and get research um, or people to be involved into research. Um, it's, I think we are dealing with a really great field to work in. It's a uh, I think it's extremely exciting to be part of it because um, we have a lot to show what we're doing. I think it, right now we are, or maybe in the beginning I was a bit shy and you know, people would kind of like look at me and go like, are you serious? You know, do you want to go into rehab? Who would do that? Why don't you go to, you know, do veterinary medicine and be a surgeon, which I, I really like. I mean, I like being in the theater and looking at what they're doing. Um, but definitely, I, I wouldn't want to change anything right now. I'm pretty happy with what, how it's evolved, I guess. So what have you been your biggest challenges? 
Um, I think what really got me into doing research um, again, since I have a PhD background and I've been in research um, and then I wanted to get away from it for a certain time, is that I did get a lot of um, backlash from the veterinary field. So they were like, well, yeah, you could do, so you could do, uh, you know, rehab after surgery, but who knows if you would be beneficial for the client or not. Um, and it, that kind of got me like focused on how will I show them how we work and what we do and what the results are. So yes, that's, uh, that's part of my motive, motivation, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a challenge for a lot of us. So, I mean, I think that I commend you on going ahead and doing the research. And so, because everything you're doing is helping all the other vet rehabbers all over the world. Because once we've got that information, when we have that vet that asks that question, we can say, well, Kiki Hausler did this research and this is what they found. Um, but how do we encourage other vet rehabbers to get into research? Because, you know, when I think about research, um, for me, it seems like something that's so out of my reach, but it isn't really. Um, it, it's something that anyone, wherever you are in the world, could get involved. You don't have to be traveling to university. I mean, like you are collecting data in your clinic um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So how, how can someone who's interested in getting involved in research, how could, how could they get into it? Well, I think basically each of us can do that. Collecting data is, um, you could use like questionnaires at your clinic. Like um, the, there's a lot of the load questionnaire is something that is validated. There are different uh, questionnaires out there, which could be added to, um, you know, the client comes in the initial visit and they will fill in the questionnaire and then you will have a follow up. So each of us can do that. And we can have like, what I think we have those groups we could also have like a share, a cloud or whatever, where we would share those data on different kinds of indications. So each of us can get involved. Um, and there's not nothing, or, you don't have to be involved uh, with, a, with a university um, to get into research. There's a lot to do in clinic and it's basically where we need to go. We need to get each of us involved and really interested and in showing what you're doing. I know that sometimes people, I don't know in, in different countries, but in Germany, we're sometimes very, you know, protective of what we're doing. And I think we do have to share what we're doing and, you know, show this is how I do it. Can you tell me how you do it and just um, learn from each other. So Doing research and, and the scientific way is great, but still you have to share your findings, you know, and sometimes there's a different approach. Everybody looks at, you know, things differently. You touch things, you see things, and I really, really encourage every, every one of us to, you know, even start with a questionnaire. That's, that's perfect. You know, if you get data together, that'd be great. You know, have like a that's what I always imagine what would be really great. Have like a cloud where we can put together all of our findings and then, you know, try to do maybe some retrospectives as well. But if we don't share, we can't do that. Yeah. You see, I think often people might stumble upon something. So maybe they've got a question of their own and they're doing their own little research just for themselves. And then there's another person with the same result, you know, and, until they share and say, this is what I'm finding. Somebody else says, well, I'm also finding this and I'm also finding that. And then it's like, okay, a group of people say, well, we need to look into this further. And that's where the sharing happens. So when we're sharing, we're actually getting a bigger picture of what's happening. Definitely. And you know, sometimes it's like when you're in within those groups, there's a lot of, well, I would, I do it this way or that way. If we have a like, you know, the approaches with the questionnaires, that's a bit more, objective not too subjective so sometimes you know you're involved you do it that way and somebody else does it differently well how can we find out which way is like the not the better but like a more broad approach to it or a more objective approach not being too subjective and too offensive sometimes in there you know 
I'd do this way or I'd do that way. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think that's sometimes the problem is that um, people are shy and they're scared to share in case they get ridiculed for something that they've said, you know? Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's everywhere. Um, so I think that it needs to be in a place that is supportive, supportive of everyone and what everyone does, you know, and I think it's so good to question. I mean, um, on our um, small animal vet rehabbers and hydro vet rehabbers, we often have people just sharing, like saying, what about this? Like, do you think this could work for this? And it's great because then people comment and say, no, I question this. And then through the conversation, you know, we're learning, we're thinking, well, actually maybe, this could work and or maybe it can't, you know, so we're learning when we share. It's great. Yeah. So um, let's chat a little bit about marketing of your practice. So having been there for 13 years um, and obviously hearing about how difficult it was for you to get the vets on board, um, what was your marketing approach when you first started and has that changed or are you doing things pretty much the same way? Well, what I did when I started off, I tried to visit the clinics and um, visit, you know, the, the vets just close to me. And it was sometimes a bit difficult as well. So you would go and see maybe some of the older vets and they would look at you and go like, well, I don't do rehab for myself. I wouldn't do it for a dog or recommend it for a dog. So, well, you know, go on. Um, and even like some of the clinics, you know, being back uh, 13 years, they would kind of like laugh at me and go like, well, this is just, you know, some sort of, it will pop up and it will leave again. But um, those clinics have a physio, um, yeah, place where they do physio, but they're not really equipped um, that well. So they've started off and they're trying to get it involved into the clinic. Um, I've tried to change my marketing from going and, you know, just going to the vets and telling them to handing out my handouts I have now. So I will send, you know, go back and forth to the vet and tell them what we're doing, how we are progressing. Sometimes if I see something, I will send them back. So that is part of my marketing with the vets and for the clients. Um, most of the time it's people talking on their, um, you know, walking their dogs, I'd say. And it's a lot of uh, Facebook and, and Instagram, to be honest. So I put a lot of, not a lot of time, but I try to find content um, that is interesting. Videos are interesting. Um, interesting articles um, put on my Facebook and my Instagram site. So yes, that's how I do marketing. So, I mean, what percentage would you say you get from word of mouth? I think I'd, it's probably 60%. Wow. Okay. Yes. And um, are you treating any specific type of pet owner? So like primarily agility dogs or, you know, competitive dogs, or is it mainly um, sort of pet owners just in general? I'd say it's mainly pet owners in general. We do have some police dogs coming to the clinic. We see some um, rescue dogs, working rescue dogs. Um, yeah, so it's a broad approach. So we're not specifically to looking at sporting dogs. We do have them coming in and getting their um, checkup on the treadmill as well. So that's probably going to change a bit more because we see more subtle lamenesses on the treadmill. So yeah, that's probably going to change a bit of the client clients we see. And um, in the marketing, I mean, do you have a marketing budget or is it primarily most of the stuff that you're doing um, sort of um, free types, types of marketing? I think it's more free types of marketing. I tried to set up a budget, but not, it doesn't really work that way. It comes to my mind and then I will do it. And um, have you tried things like Facebook ads and Google ads or have you not dabbled in that yet? I tried it in the beginning with the Google ads and I even tried uh, Facebook ads, but I'm, I haven't really had that success with it. So I haven't seen any people really referring to that. So yeah. I stopped doing that. What I did, like last year, we had um, um, 
one of the influencers close to us come in or two of them um, and they will you know have their dogs do stuff on maybe the treadmill or the underwater treadmill and they would help us with the marketing so I think that's probably going to be the future um, having influencers come into the clinic and um, having their dogs being yeah. treated yeah, I must say, I mean, being online myself, um, Google ads and Facebook ads are so daunting because um, one minute they work, the next minute they don't. And so, um, I, I stay clear of them too. I, um, I, I rely on word of mouth. I think it's safer. It just makes you more honest because you just do what you need to do and do it well. And then people will talk about you. Yes. So with all those patients and that research, um, do you have any hobbies that, and do you have any time to do any hobbies? <laughs> well, when I'm, um, when I'm on my dog walks, I really like to take pictures a lot. Um, and when I have uh, time, I really like to spend it with my daughter. So I like to take her places go to fun parks. Um, recently, I haven't been doing a lot of, you know, uh, workout for myself. I used to go to a box, boxing place, uh, which would get some of my stress off. So that's uh, something I'm going to do in January again. But I was pretty busy and we had somebody leave the clinic and I had to get back another person. So that was that transition phase was, yes, a bit exhausting. So, yes. I normally I love to do sports. I used to play European handball a lot, and then that's why I probably got involved in boxing again. <laughs> so yes. So is it one on one boxing or just like a boxing? Um, no, it's one on one boxing. It's actually a place, so I have to go somewhere. I'm not very disciplined in uh, doing stuff at home, so I have to go somewhere and have somebody you know really make me do stuff. So it's ninety minutes of actual exhausting workout but i really like it yes and i can imagine it must release a lot of tension oh, I'm so, it does. yeah i mean i do i've done at the gym that kickboxing you know and um especially when i've got lots of frustration i just kick and punch into the air it's great i love it yes yes so actually that's uh, i could recommend that to anybody who has stress uh, it's a real stress relief I'm, I'm not really a yoga person so i'd like to do that because i think it would maybe calm me but I'm, i can't my my mind will go crazy if i'm somewhere doing slow movements i can't yeah i'm the same i get frustrated with the yoga yeah. and pilates i feel like um in order to be able to release that stress and to exercise i need to be perspiring and out of breath and if i'm not then i'm not exercising it's just a mindset thing for me I yes, yes. you're the same Definitely. i'm the same <laughs> yeah and um, so obviously all the research that you do um there are people that are um join you with it there are people that support you there are companies that um, fund you so give them a little shout out because i'm sure that you really appreciate all the support that you get well yeah actually thank you for asking because i'm um, really happy to work with starts medical that's the company um, that produces the shockwave i'm working with so i'm working with a focus and a radial shockwave and the pulse electromagnetic field is also um, from this company so they were supportive and they got me in touch with uh, cambridge which made a lot of things happen so and um the other thing was the treadmill. We kind of like discovered it together, um, the professor from Cambridge and me, because I was looking for a device to use in clinic to do clinical uh, research in clinic um, to share. Um, and that is um, Zebras Medical. That's a company which is uh, located close to us here. So, and I helped um, get the algorithm going. We collected a ton of data. I have like a computer with a ton of data and so that's how um, it's a bit of a developmental thing as well so we helped each other and um, but they're very supportive as well yes awesome and um, I, I don't know where you found all the time because now you also do a lot of lecturing and so are there any up-and-coming lectures that you're doing or anything that you've been busy with lecturing wise um, well, I'm doing some lecturing now on um, the treadmill, um, how to use gait analysis, how to look at what we're doing. Um, if we look at um, 
gate in canines. Um, and what I've done just recently is now I'm a certified um, AO peer teacher. AO is the a AO Foundation is a yeah, association that um, wants to look at how to help people in the medical field to get involved into research again. So there's a lot of things we have to deal with, like the ethics committee, um, how to get funding, how will I do research, how do I look into PubMed to find um, literature. Um, so the AO peer courses are mainly focused on how can we get involved into research to take some of the fear out of it that it's not, you know, you have to be hugely involved with the, with the universities. So it mainly helps you um, to look at what you what you're dealing with when you want to start research. Yes, so that is something I highly recommend. Um, it helps a lot. There's a lot of hints with medical writing as well and funding. So yeah, that is my dream. Awesome. My dream. So vet rehabbers, if any of you are interested in um, doing any of those courses, I will put the URLs in, in the podcast notes. Kiki, thank you so much for your time. I've so um, enjoyed listening to everything and appreciate everything that you're doing um, for the vet rehabbers because everyone in our field that's involved in research is helping us all. So thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Megan. And I think uh, like the online health, pet health um, platform is a really, really good thing. I always look into the podcast and, you know, look um, into the group and see how people get involved um, and, you know, share things. And I think it's a great thing to do. Thank you for doing that. Pleasure. Have an awesome day, Kiki. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Vet Rehabbers, for more information on how to take your career to the next level, go to www.onlinepetalt.com. Please don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you'll get notified. I'm here every single week talking to vet rehabbers from all over the world, learning, and I would love you to join me. Hope you have an awesome day further. Cheers for now.